Tonight on Capitol Journal, a busy week at the State House as lawmakers gather for budget updates. We'll take you inside the meetings. The state's Cannabis Commission adopts final rules for medical marijuana. Director John McMillan explains. Cam Ward of the Bureau of Pardons and Paroles explains electronic monitoring and preventing opioid deaths. State Senator Greg Albritton discusses the challenging situation in Alabama's prisons. House Minority Leader Anthony Daniels discusses the state's use of ARPA money and his party's electoral performance. And Steve Murray of the Department of Archives and History explains how the state is reuniting Native American tribes with sensitive artifacts. It's all next on Capital Journal. From our State House studio in Montgomery, I'm Todd Stacy. Welcome to Capital Journal. It was a busy week in the capital city, and we'll begin with the governor's office which dismissed what it called bogus rumors about Governor Kay Ivey's health. The statement came after AL.com's Kyle Whitmire wrote a column questioning Ivey's health amid her office's lack of response to his inquiries. That only fueled the Montgomery rumor mill, leading to communications director Gina Mayola to put, out the issue, to, put the issue to rest. She said, quote, Governor Ivey is doing great, and she continues to thank the good Lord for keeping her healthy and cancer free. We look forward to her leading the state of Alabama for years to come. Ivy was treated for lung cancer in 2019 and was declared cancer free in early 2020. And this afternoon, Ivy greeted South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem, who is visiting the state for the Republican Party's summer dinner tonight. Photos of the greeting provided by the governor's office show Ivy in good spirits. On to the legislature, where there were multiple oversight hearings this week. We'll start with the ARPA oversight meeting, which included reports from the Department of Environmental Management, the Department of Economic and Community Affairs, as well as the state's hospital and nursing home communities. State Finance Director Bill Poole gave lawmakers an overview of how the first half of Alabama's $2.2 billion has been allocated so far. For everybody's reminder, the reporting requirements as it relates to the ARPA funds, they are very onerous. They are, are enormous reporting requirements. And as you'll see, there are annual reports, there are quarterly reports on all these funds. These funds are going out to a lot of different entities. And in our MOUs, our memorandums of understanding, we're being clear that they have to give us the data back and finance so that we can report in a compliant fashion up to Treasury. And I would say maybe more for uh, the audience and the public, the audits on these funds are going to come. And it's going to be very important that the state administer these funds in a manner that there are clean audit trails. We do not want to be in a negative audit position uh, in the out years. Uh, finance has uh, complied thus far with all reporting requirements on time. But per the timeline I've set forth quarterly through the end of 2026, this is going to be an ongoing project and a big project. Poole also itemized the funds or how the funds have been dispersed so far. Let's take a look first at the fiscal rescue funds. $80 million went to reimburse hospitals and nursing homes. $51 million went to broadband network enhancements. $225 million went to water and sewer improvements. And $79 million went to shore up the state's unemployment compensation fund to avoid a tax increase on businesses. Next, the revenue replacement funds over which the state has more flexibility. Uh, $400 million of those funds went to the prison construction project. Uh, $34 million went to broadband improvements. $30 million to rural hospitals and so on. Uh, and by the way, another $192 million from the ARPA capital improvement funds went to, went, also went to rural broadband expansion. Also meeting this week was the Joint Legislative Budget Committee, which has been conducting hearings this summer to see how inflation and gas prices are impacting state agencies. Kirk Fulford of the Legislative Services Agency says for the last three months, the state's economy has set multiple positive records. He said there's one indicator in particular that he's tracking. 
I watch withholdings payments daily and, and monthly. Withholdings payments are going to take you directly to the strength of the economy because that's what people are comes out of what people are getting paid and, and it's you know, that number being above four percent is usually good a good indication for me that we're in a in a positive uh, track in terms of our economy. The number is ten and a half percent for the year, although the July number was actually basically flat. Ten and a half percent growth for the year is far and above greater than average growth for withholding. Average growth since 2001 in withholdings payments is only 3.7%. 2021 is seven and, well, seven and a half percent. We're sitting right now at 10 and a half percent. Those two numbers alone are so far above what the average growth in withholdings payments is and, and a indication of the strength of our current economic conditions for Alabama. Lawmakers heard from Department of Corrections Commissioner John Hamm who discussed the multiple challenges facing his agency. Capitol Journal's Karen Goldsmith has that story. In his informal budget presentation, Alabama Department of Corrections Commissioner John Hamm shared that his agency is like a 20,000 population town and they face the same issue any community faces. So of course they are feeling the effects of inflation. He listed nine categories, for example, the food has approximately 23% inflation. Fiscal year 21, it was about $2.15 a day for inmate raw food. Fiscal year 22, we estimate $2.42. He also shared that clothing for inmates and staff have increased by 20% or $1.3 million. And like many employers, they too are facing staff shortages, especially with hiring corrections officers. Uh, starting salary for a correctional officer, I think it's about 33000 We actually uh, probably start them a couple of steps up the ladder, about uh, step three. We're competing with other law enforcement agencies in this state. Police departments, sheriff's offices, that's our competition for people wanting to get in this line of work. And we've done a survey and most of those departments start off around the mid 40s. The department has a six prong employee growth plan that includes hiring people part time, which has been effective in other states. One lawmaker likes that idea. I now have a couple hundred employees, 50 of them are part time and it works for them, works for me as well, but whatever's uh, you need just I think that's some of what you should present to let us know if there's anything that we can do to make that happen because we're looking for the safety of the employees we're also looking for the safety of the inmates too and uh, trying to make sure that we meet all the needs that the lawsuit requires. The state is under a court order to hire 3,826 corrections officers by July 1st 2025 they currently have 1,800 79. For Capital Journal, I'm Karen Goldsmith. Commissioner Ham also gave an update on the state's prison construction plan. He said site prep work is being done right now and that construction could start on the first facility as soon as November. They're leveling the field. They had to do some uh, land clearing. They're filling it. They're building the uh, construction pad, road construction, and as the timeline has been for some time, the completion date, estimated completion date, is January of 26 for the Elmore facility. We're also planning, even though 2026 seems like a long time off, we're actually in the planning process now of transitioning into new facilities because you know, the first slide of food, clothing, housing, all these janitorial supplies, staff, it's going to be a monumental task of transferring inmates into this uh, new facility in Elmore and the one in Escambia. So we're, we're planning now because you just don't move 4,000 inmates at one time into facilities. Also meeting this week was the Alabama Medical Cannabis Commission which adopted final regulations for medical marijuana licensing. Companies seeking licenses to grow, process, test, transport, or sell medical marijuana 
can, can request an application beginning September 1st. The deadline to apply is December 31st. Commission Director John McMillan called the meeting productive. Extremely important meeting because we adopted the uh, final version of the rules and regulations for governing the whole process, the licensing and everything to do with uh, moving forward with getting this agency up and running. The fact that we can take this product, medical cannabis, um, make sure that the public safety and health of the, of the citizens of Alabama are at the forefront and ensure that this product is safe, it's going to help out a lot of people, particularly that need medications for um, HIV, people that need medications for epilepsy, um, people that need medications for Parkinson's, people that need medications for spasticity, seizures. According to the commission, the earliest medical marijuana products will be available for patients is late 2023. Well, it's back to school time in Alabama, and thankfully, we are no longer in a COVID-19 emergency situation. However, the pandemic has changed our daily lives in ways we may not realize, including in the classroom. Capital Journal's Randy Scott reports. It's August, and around Alabama, that means it's back to school time for thousands of students, parents, and teachers. Getting ready for classes isn't just about getting pencils, paper, and notebooks. This is our busy season, especially for our pediatric department, because we have a lot of kids coming in. They need their vaccinations, they need their physicals, their sports physicals. They're, they're ready to go back to, to school. Health Services Incorporated Marketing Director Ebony Evans says her agency and other medical facilities around the state are busy helping parents get their children health ready for school. We participate in a lot of community health fairs and where they're giving out book bags and we give our information on how they can come and receive care with us. And we actually have four school based clinics with the Montgomery Public School System. Also making sure access to health care is available to students. And those children in, in those set four schools that we're in have access to a medical provider. If they don't feel good or, or have an appointment or need a physical, they're able to receive those services through us at their school. The goal, taking some pressure off parents by making sure students get checkups and even vaccines if needed to attend school. Some of them have a lot going on trying to maneuver through their normal work day and their kids are going back to school. They've been home all summer or, or in their prospective summer camps and so they're, they're trying to adjust and reschedule and, and get back to those things that are normal for them and a lot of schools are going back in person and so we still are vaccinating the children as needed uh, and, and making sure that they have a healthy school year. For Capital Journal, I'm Randy Scott. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online at video.aptv.org. Capital Journal episodes are also available on APTV's free mobile app. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. And you can listen to past episodes of Capital Journal when you're driving or on the go with Capital Journal Podcasts. Keep up with what's happening with Capital Journal. Next, I'm joined by Cam Ward, Director of the Bureau of Pardons and Paroles. Cam, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me back again, Todd. Great to be back on. Yeah, great to have you. Um, your agency's in the news this week. Uh, the, the case of Jimmy O'Neill Spencer. Of course, this was the um, person who w was on out on parole while, and also committed, uh, I guess, three homicides while out on parole. It was a huge scandal, a big case that really um, rocked the state, I guess, about four years ago, um, or back in 2019, 2018 time frame. He was not paroled. That was as expected. Nobody expected his, um, his, him to be paroled, but the case came up. Uh, is that what you expected? Yeah, so Jimmy Spencer really was a tragic case. Uh, in 2018, he had been out on parole. Uh, the board at that time had paroled him. He got out and just a few months later murdered three people up in Marshall County. 
He hasn't been tried yet or been convicted yet of that, but he was automatically revoked from his parole during that time. Since then, he's kind of been awaiting a parole hearing again. I think the board at that time thought, well, maybe he just, uh, he'll go to trial, be convicted again, and then he won't come back. He won't be eligible for parole hearing again. However, he's never been convicted or tried. So therefore, he was eligible for a hearing, but no one really thought Jimmy Spencer was ever going to get granted parole. I mean, that was just a no-brainer. So It was he, just scheduled. Yeah, it, it was scheduled by his legal rights. He was entitled to a hearing. I think the three-member board, they voted unanimously against him getting parole, and that was pretty much expected. That was why they passed legislation in 2019 to overhaul the Pardon and Parole Board and the Bureau to change that structure so that someone like Jimmy Spencer couldn't get out again. I was going to say, that case really was the impetus behind some of the, the fundamental reforms to you know, the, the Bureau and the Board uh, that was passed back, back then. Has that culture changed? I mean, I know you've been there uh, more than a year now. Yeah, 20, uh, December will be two years for me. Yeah, actually. okay. Would you say that culture has changed as a result of those reforms uh, proposed by Governor Ivey and passed by the legislature? Yeah, and there's been a lot of, this is an agency that's always gonna have controversy. It's a pendulum agency. So in 2019 legislation that passed said, the bureau director of my job will no longer work for the board. I, I don't work for the board. I don't have a say in who gets grant granted or denied parole, but I work directly for the governor. We handle what happens once you get out. So that was a big change in it. Another big change was the board was required. They have a set of procedures and policies that the law put in place they have to follow. So yes, there's been a dramatic change. Some would say good, uh, saying that, look, there's a lot less Jimmy Spencer's ever getting out. Some would say bad and that you have a lower parole or pardon grant rate, but at the end of the day, the reforms, I, I think they've worked. Now, there's can we tweak it some? Sure, but I think at the end of the day, uh, the parole changes, pardon grant changes, how they change the agency is working the way we're doing it now. Um, I know that you are getting your bureau officers trained on Narcan. This is a, a drug that is, is used in treating an opioid overdose. Tell me more about why this is uh, happening. Well, what we're seeing is a large, and we've seen it particularly in rural areas, where you're seeing a huge increase in overdoses for those who are hooked on opioids. Those who are overdosing on opioids, but not only that, officers, because we have nearly 500 law enforcement officers who work for us at the Bureau of Pardon and Parole, what we're seeing is a number of officers also being exposed to fentanyl. Mm. Because it's involved in the crime scene they come up on, and that can lead to an immediate overdose. It kills people. What Narcan does is it allows for a simple breathing, almost like a nasal spray, through the nose, and it can prevent you from dying from an overdose. We use that both for the people that are using the drugs as well as our officers who are exposed to it. Through a grant process in collaboration with Department of Mental Health, we're going to utilize that in every single officer in our state. And I think it's going to help us tremendously in preventing the overdose cases. How big of a problem is uh, opioid just in terms of contributing to recidivism? I mean, I it's a huge problem. If you look at the largest number of people who recidivate in Alabama, and, and for those who don't know in the audience, recidivism is those who were in prison, they got out, then they go back. And in Alabama, we're 25th in the country. We're not the top, we're not the bottom, we're right in the middle on those who commit crimes again after being in prison. But one of the biggest drivers of recidivism is those who have a drug addiction and somehow do that. In addition to a drug addiction, they commit another crime like burglary, theft, or a property crime. It's a big issue, but it also, it's a, it's a huge killer. Mm. Uh, talk to me about electronic monitoring. I know the legislature passed um, some requirements on electronic monitoring for some uh, those that y'all monitor, um, but y'all have really been ramping this up. What's the latest? Well, the legislature told us last year they wanted to see us electronically monitor more people. So, for example, there's a program now uh, where people are on what's called mandatory supervision. They, they're they out six months before their sentence ends, and they have to be, for example, monitored. They're, they're under our jurisdiction. The legislature said, we want you monitoring more and more people to make sure we don't have someone on parole who commits a new crime. Mm -hmm. So the, the charge to us was monitor those on mandatory supervision, which will be about 400 people. However, we feel like with the money they gave us, we can monitor up to 4,000 people. 
and we think that'll be a huge tool for law enforcement to just as another way of making sure we're keeping up with people, making sure someone on probation and parole follows the guidelines they've been given, the instructions they've been given, drug treatment, job placement, where they're supposed to be, where they're not supposed to be. This will be a tool to help us make sure they're following the law. Mm. Well, there's a, we had another budget hearing this week, and there was yet more talk about inflation and its impact on state agencies. I know that it's been a few weeks, but you were you testified in one yeah. of these budget hearings about inflation and how gas prices were impacting your Bureau of Pardons and Parole specifically. How, you know your folks out in the field. Is that still the case? Yeah, it is. So when gas prices go up, we have our agency at Bureau of Pardon and Parole, Aaliyah. Uh, other agencies, DHR is probably one. You have several agencies where we have people in the field that have to go check in on someone on parole, someone on probation. We have to go out physically and drive out there and find them. So we have a large fleet. When you have a large fleet, that costs money and gas and time. And when gas prices go up, it really chews into your budget. Although it's not as bad as it was probably three or four months ago when I testified, it's still a problem. And so. We hope to avoid, although it's not off the table, having to park automobiles. And when you do something like that due to the gas prices and inflation, what it does is it increases a public safety hazard. Mm -hmm. We, One of our biggest functions, we have not quite 800 employees. Most of our people are law enforcement. And that law enforcement agency, like we have, your job is to be out in the field, not sitting in an office behind a desk. And when you do that, you've got to have gas to pay for, to get out there and see them. Mm -hmm. Does it, is it something that you're going to try to prepare for in next year's budget as you get ready for the next legislative yeah, session? Yeah, we're, we're going to see. The good thing is, you know, they don't go back into session until March. Mm -hmm. So we'll have a better idea before then where the gas price situation is. If the current gas prices continue to go down as they have the last four or five weeks, we may be okay. However, if they remain abnormally high, then yeah, we'll have to prepare for it in the budget. And that's, it's hard because it's different by agency. Some agencies, you may have an automobile fleet, but you could do things telework, or you could do things remotely that you don't have to do in person. When you're a parole officer, these law enforcement folks have to drive at all hours of the night, all hours of the day, to go see the person they're overseeing. And when they do that, they got the gas, it, it just costs money. And so that's something we're going to continue to monitor. We're not the only ones, though. I think other agencies are dealing with inflation issues. Mm -hmm. um, talk to me about uh, the Perry County facility. Where are we in? I know that's a big part yeah. of the prison construction overall vision. Uh, how is that proceeding? So, you know, Perry County is interesting. It, it came about based upon the uh, 2021 special session on the prison construction when they built the two new prisons. One of the things they wanted to do was find out what do you do with that Perry County prison? It's empty. And DOC said at the time, look, we can't staff it, so we don't want it. No one ever wanted it, but there were several folks who said, well, why do we have this empty building we can't use it? That's when pardon and parole, it was sold to us. The legislature paid for it. We're gonna use it for a, basically a mega day reporting center. Someone would say, well, what's a day reporting center? What that is, is we have 11 day reporting centers that currently support about 25 to 30 people in each facility. All it does is do drug rehabilitation, mental health, and job training. What Perry County will do is be a day reporting center on steroids. It'll have about 200 to 250 people and all it will do is be a residential center for those who are coming out of prison to get a re-entry plan. Drug rehabilitation, um, mental health treatment, job training to help them go back into society and reduce recidivism. It goes back to what we said earlier. Someone gets a job, we reduce the, the mental health illness, we help them cope with an addiction. The recidivism rate drops from 30% down to 3%. They just don't commit crimes again. So I think Perry County is the future of how you deal with reentry in Alabama. How, how soon until we could expect it to open? I think our first clients will come in the end of November, um, and then that'll slowly build up from there. We have, we'll have about 40 employees out there. We haven't had trouble at all hiring security officers or the treatment staff. We're finishing up now on the contracts for mental health and the health care we have to provide under the law. But I think it's going to be a great plan. I think it's going to be a huge, huge plus for us as a state in reducing recidivism. I would imagine also, since it's it's unique and, in, and not in a 
otherwise prison setting that maybe that could make a difference so you're, you're not also housing maximum security in no no it, it'll be a select population only those who are eligible for the program and that's not to say violent versus non-violent what you do is when someone goes to that program this can be based upon their risk assessment is it someone who needs this treatment someone who needs this job training not everyone can go there but i think if we can make that kind of program available and then replicate it around the state I think it'll be a huge opportunity for Alabama to reduce recidivism. Now, the next step after that is we have a facility in Thomasville, Alabama. And we haven't talked about this before, but I'll, I'll say it here. I think openly what we should look at is why don't we have also a women's facility? Because mm -hmm. Perry County is strictly a men's facility. We need a women's facility that provides reentry programming, such as drug treatment, mental health, and job training. I think Thomasville, Alabama, it used to be Life Tech, could also fill that role. I think that helps address the women population as well. Well, before I let you go, I know that you're you're going to be looking for at least one more new employee because you've got Jerry Starnes, yes, uh, who it looks like he's headed to the legislature. Great guy. Of course, you served in the legislature for many years. Have you offered him any advice? Yeah, just follow, learn the rules, and and find you a couple mentors. So I, I had some great mentors for me, and um, I learned the rules eventually. But I will say also learn from the stumbles you make because you will make stumbles in the legislature he's a great guy he'll do a good job in the house and uh, i'd give that advice to anybody because yep. uh, i certainly learn from my mistakes march will be here before you know it before you know it thanks again for coming on the show thanks for having me on again todd right. thank you we'll be right back you're watching alabama public television Next, I'm joined by State Senator Greg Albritton. Senator, thanks for coming on Capitol Journal. Thanks for having us. Do we shake hands? <laughs> well, we, we certainly can. Well, uh, <laughs> but there we go. There you go. I don't know what the newest COVID protocols are. Yeah, whatever. Um, lots of budget meetings today uh, and this week. Uh, you had budget update hearings from the Alabama Department of Corrections and also ARPA. We'll get to ARPA later, but... Yeah, this um, was a pretty long presentation from the Department of Corrections. A lot of questions asked from committee members. What were your main takeaways from the corrections budget hearing? Oh, good question. Uh, the, the main takeaway is is I, I, we don't have the complete answer of how to hire people, but that transcends just DOC. That, that's the state in general. If we, we can't hire people. Uh, for mental health or several other things. Uh, we have something in our economy that just does not draw people to be hired at this point. Uh, that's a problem. Uh, as we discussed, uh, we've, we've done uh, bonuses, we've done overtime, we've done uh, restructuring of, of, um, of um, uh, levels of employment and such. We've tried lots of things and put millions of dollars into it and we have fewer people now than we had four years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, it certainly seemed pretty dire I mean, looking at those numbers as um, the director was putting them up there. I mean, uh, more than 500 vacancies. Yeah. And, and that uh, that doesn't even count the increases we're supposed to have. Uh, Precisely. According to or uh, under that federal court order, right? Correct. Exactly. Um, uh, it, it's a difficult situation to be in. But uh, Commissioner Ham is working on it. Uh, we, I know that he understands the problems, and that's one thing we took from today. He understands what the challenges are. Uh, we've got to work together to find the solutions, and he's willing to do that. So that, that's kind of my takeaway is we're going to, you know, when you're plowing a field and you're going, you've never done this, you're too young, but you're heading down the furrows and, and the end is so far away, you eventually get to it. it just keep moving forward. That's the same thing here. Well, I know, you know, during the talk of the prison construction plan, um, that was it, was, it was discussed that, okay, if we get these things online, there'll be safer facilities. Correct. Um, re require fewer staffing to begin with. Correct. Um, but, th but make it a more attractive place to go to work <laughs> compared to the current that are just frankly dangerous and, and uh, unsafe in many ways. But... Those new facilities aren't coming on until what, 2026? About 30 months if, uh, once we get good and started, about 30 months, correct, okay. two and a half years. So, you know, are we worried at all about 
federal in- intervention before those new prisons open? I don't think so. Uh, I, we're doing all that we can and all that we know how. And, and um, uh, I, I'm not convinced because the times that the feds did take over in different places, it wasn't any better. It didn't help. Uh, they have that ability to do so. They can do that. Uh, I hope they don't, and I, don't, I do not believe they will. We're doing everything that we can right now to make things better. I think we're on the right track. Uh, we've got to keep, as I said, plowing that furrow, heading toward the end of the row. Mm-hmm. I know that the district attorneys were scheduled to come today. That didn't end up happening, I guess, the, the reschedule for the future? Yes, yes. Uh, those, uh, one, one of the uh, main guys that was involved with the presentation simply wound up in the hospital. And uh, so we, we needed to push that around. And plus, they have another report that's due, uh, and they're working on that. They'll have that ready ne- by next month, uh, so I'm told. So we'll be, we'll be ready for it at that point. Well, these budget hearings have been interesting, um, not just for those. Well, the, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> well, not just for those of us in the news who need things to report on, but, I mean, normally in the, in the dog days of summer, we're not, we don't hear much about state budgets and things like this, but these are extraordinary economic times and so it's it's been I know I've learned a lot from from attending but let me ask you have they accomplished what you wanted to you set out to do this year in this, these series of budget hearings they are accomplishing what we needed to do I, I do believe so now we haven't finished yet and we may have to do some more of them even after September uh, the important part is to bring to the level of knowledge not just to legislators and my committee but also to the attention of of the agencies and the state employees and others that are affected every day by this of how inflation and how the economy is affecting us and what's the future look like Uh, you can listen to TV all day long Uh, the national news gives you um, a plethora of different directions we here in Alabama think we have a pretty good handle of where we're headed and what we believe is going to happen and we are more prepared for it than we have ever been and uh, we're going to keep doing what we're doing and I wanted everyone else to be aware of the challenges that's coming forward and the 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 paths we're going to have to take to to be ready for it and to deal with it Mm -hmm. do you think it helps lawmakers to you know to prepare more for the the upcoming legislative session when they're here in montgomery taking part in the, these kind of things in the quote unquote off season do you think it helps members themselves of course anytime you're you're away from something it doesn't mean the grass stops growing okay it just means that by the time you come back it's too high to cut mm-hmm. and and that's the same thing when when we get here with uh with legislature we, we stay going in the off season, and when you come here, it is, um, it's, it's another learning curve. What I'm trying to accomplish with this is to keep that learning curve on a more even keel so that we can have a better ability to deal with it. I've even noticed a few incoming freshmen attending these meetings. Exactly. So that's, that's pretty interesting. I, and I hope that they would show. That, that is an indication of an interest, and, and uh, learning begins. Mm-hmm. Well, let's switch gears to ARPA. You had another oversight hearing for these ARPA funds. You heard from ADEM, you know, Environmental Management, ADECA, of course, the finance director, Correct. also hospitals and nursing homes. These represent pretty much what ARPA-1 was spent on. Um, what were your big take? Were you pleased with what you heard in terms of how the agencies are going about spending this money? Well, um, I have my own issues along that line. I, I I'm a little bit impatient. I would love to have seen more of the money already in the ground. For instance, the uh, water uh, programs. We've we've appropriated this back in January, and now we're in August. And while um, there's been selections and decisions made, none of the money has gone out. Nothing has gotten in the ground yet. Uh, I know there's a process, and I know it takes time, and I know that they're working with the same um, bureaucratic infrastructure that they've always had, meaning that they haven't hired anybody Mm -hmm. additional, yet they're doing three times the work. I'm sensitive to that, but I'm a bit impatient that the money remains in the bank. Could they hire – you're you're thinking about, like, engineers and things like that, right, that are having to approve these things – 
could they hire that type of folks or, or people on, on part-time basis with with this temporary money? I don't know. Uh, that that's something that we thought about, uh, and all of us have thought about. But in, in Alabama, whether it be the executive department, uh, uh, the governor's office, uh, or the agencies, none of them have taken that step. None of of them have gone out and hired new people to come in and assist and help on this. They're all trying to do it with the infrastructure that they have, and I appreciate that. I do. That that. I think shows a frugality that is rare in, in government. That shows a determination to work and to get the job done with the resources that we have. I think that's a message in itself. Uh, but doggone, it's frustrating. <laughs> well, it's not, you know, the legislative session is in March. I assume ARPA 2 will happen around that same time. You know, maybe it is a special within the session, whatever. Um, is it too early to say? what y'all are looking at in terms of ARPA 2 and how that next 1.1 billion dollars is going to be spent? Yeah, it's still it's still too early. We uh, uh, we, we did have a meeting today, uh, more, mostly an informal uh, gathering uh, of a few to, to discuss what directions, uh, general directions, needed. we needed to go in. No decisions were made, nothing was uh, um, written on paper or anything of that nature to uh, uh, in concrete. We just wanted to find out how we um, uh, are thinking in lines of whether we want to redo what we've done, go in a different direction, and, and all of us are getting calls and demands and, and presentations of what needs are, and we're trying to digest that mm -hmm. uh, to get a, get a direction of where we can do, what we, where we should head. Well, it's kind of interesting to think about because, all right, so this, this ARPA-2 money will be will be appropriated in 2023. Correct. Right? Really three years after um, this COVID emergency really happened. This is Correct. ostensibly COVID money, right? Correct. And so it, priorities change, right? I mean, we don't have the same emergency state that, that we did with the, the height of the pandemic. So I wonder if Congress may even get some more flexibility in terms of how to spend this money. Maybe, maybe. And that's one thing we're waiting to see. We don't know that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there was a, a concern, frankly, uh, about what direction they were going to take with that money, and particularly with the money that hasn't gone out yet. Uh, um, but I think we're fairly comfortable at this point that we're going to have the 1.067 billion, I think it is, that that we're going to have to appropriate and uh, send out for the benefit of Alabamians. I think we're also in the same mode that that we want this to be one-time money, monies that will build for the future and not for the past. Uh, COVID has already been what three years away. You said. Uh, we need to look forward to the next three to five to ten years, and that's what we're trying to focus on. Well, something to watch moving forward. Senator, thanks again for coming on the show. Is that all the time I get? That's all the time for now. All <laughs> right. we'll, we'll have you back very soon. All right. Thank you. All Appreciate right. it. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online anytime at Alabama Public Television's website, aptv.org. Click on the online video tab on the main page. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. Next, I'm joined by State Representative Anthony Daniels, Minority Leader for the House of Representatives. Mr. Daniels, thanks for coming on Capital Journal. Well, thank you for having me, Todd. It's always good to see you. You too, you too. Well, it was a busy State House this week as a lot of these budget hearings were happening. You participated in one specific to ARPA. Y'all are kind of having some oversight over how these state agencies are spending their the ARPA funds that y'all appropriated. What were your big takeaways from today? Well, my takeaways are there are a lot of needs out there, and, and, and so we're just scratching the surface on them. Uh, he hearing the report from the Nursing Home Association, uh, the Hospital Association, ADEM, ADECA, uh, really opened my eyes to how the monies are being spent. 
Uh, of course, there's always questions and things are not moving fast enough for some, some of us uh, because our communities necessar are not necessarily on the top priority list. But the way that the uh, directors explain um, how they're making the first tranche of funding from their offices disbursements mm -hmm. uh, makes sense to me. Uh, focusing on those really critical need areas first and they're not done with the process and there are other communities across the state that are being considered uh, but they are they want to make certain that those that are in dire need uh, were among the highest priority of the list that they need to get to right away. So I was very pleased to hear that report. Yeah, there, there kind of was this back and forth about you know, fast growing areas because that is a that's a need for the, if you're growing fast, you need water and sewer. Versus existing rural communities, you know, like in the Black Belt, like we've you know, Hansville, all it's been reported that there's it's crumbling infrastructure, crumbling water. So there's this kind of back and forth about that. You represent a fast growing area. You represent you know one of the fastest growing areas in the state. So from that perspective, what, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I think that to the senator's point earlier, uh, there are communities like the community that I live in that has the ability to provide matching funds and they're growing exponentially uh, with growth and in individuals moving in every day. Uh, and so um, th there, there's a point there. But we still cannot ignore the fact that many of these rural communities, and I'm from a rural community, I grew up in Midway, Alabama, just about 45 minutes from here. Mm -hmm. And so I understand the need for infrastructure in those communities. And those communities have not necessarily had uh, the resources to uh, apply for federal funding and get an opportunity. And so hopefully this is a jump start with, with really developing those infrastructures and helping those communities be able to sustain itself long term. And but without and also paying attention to our larger communities uh, that's trying to keep up with the growth, and so there there are tremendous amount of uh, an increase in demand for more more needs and building that infrastructure long term for the current growth and the uh, growth that we'll be experiencing long term. So I was going to ask you, have you seen any of these projects get off the ground in North Alabama where you represent, whether it's water and sewer, broadband? I know was a big one, um, and then of course the roads. Of course, roads are, are, are you know, that, that those projects are going uh, along pretty well in North Alabama and across the state. I've seen in a lot of different areas that talk about Rebuild Alabama and the infrastructure down in the Abbeville, Hetland area. I uh, was happy to see that, seeing the infrastructure, uh, you know, over in uh, Lowndes County and Prattville area, Togable area. Uh, and seeing things in Clark County and other places across the state uh, where many of our, our legislators represent those communities. And so those communities should be proud of their legislators and the work that they've been able to do to secure that funding for the opportunities. Mm -hmm. Well, switching gears real quick, I haven't caught up with you since the election really, or since the primary and primary runoff. Um, and, and of course, these elections are continuing. We have a general coming up. Um, how, how did, how were you, uh, were you pleased about the turnout, the uh, performance of your caucus in their primaries and did, how, did, how did they fare? I thought my caucus members did extremely well in their primaries. Uh, oftentimes when we uh, were talking during the session and I'm encouraging us uh, to participate in town hall meetings and engage our constituents, uh, it appeared that it worked out and, and it paid off. And so uh, my caucus members or uh, a lot of my caucus members were, were, were great. Their performance was high uh, and it showed me that they are in tune and in touch with their constituents. And so, you know, that's, that's all you can ask for in, in, in caucus members is, you know, those individuals that are working hard, that are following the playbook, uh, they always do well. Mm -hmm. You're also going to have some new faces probably when the legislature comes back in March. Uh, how's that work from a leadership perspective? You got a you know, bunch of new, 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 fo new folks in the legislature. Well, it's exciting uh, because a lot of the folks that are, in, that are new coming in uh, you know, they they bring something to the table. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, when you're out recruiting or when you're seeking candidates to run for public office uh, now or in the future, you want to make certain that there are individuals that bring some diversity in thought, mm -hmm. careers, um, gender diversity, ethnic diversity uh, to the table so that it can make for better lawmakers. We need subject matter experts in all different walks of life because many of us, we, we know a little bit about a lot of things, but having those subject matter experts that you can depend on is extremely important. Um, there's all this talk about closed primaries. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Republican Party is going to meet this weekend, probably going to pass a resolution, even though, I mean, it, it's, it would take a uh, action by the legislature to actually go to this. We're only 
people that are registered as Republicans vote in the Republican primary. Only people that are registered as Democrats vote, the, and so none of this crossover, I guess you'd say. From a from your perspective, I know you're not the chairman of the party, but what is your perspective as a Democrat? I'm certainly against uh, closed primaries. I think that you know you have individuals, especially young people today, that doesn't identify with either party. And so those individuals that are in the middle that are, um, you know, independent or apolitical, right, that have not identified with the party but understand and like certain aspects or attributes for each of the parties and they want to make, you know, pick and choose who, you know, who they want to vote for, uh, should not be limited to a primary, um, to, to being in one party or the other in a primary. Because if there's not a Democratic primary and these individuals typically lean Democrat, well, they may see someone that they may like on the Republican primary, but they won't have that opportunity. Uh, for me, I can tell you politically, it is, uh, it'll is it'll be damaging to the Republican Party uh, if, we, if there are closed primaries. And I will tell you that uh, you think you have individuals that pretend to be party bosses now. Uh, a person can single-handedly control every primary if you close primaries. Mm. Because you'll have those loyal uh, party people that'll be the only ones voting in those primaries, and oftentimes you end up surfacing, the, the most extreme candidate end up surfacing, and that's not good for Alabama, that's not good for growth, and that's not good for opportunity long term. So I assume you will resist this uh, if it becomes legislation next session? Yes, I'll be against it in principle. Principle-wise, I'll be against it, because individuals, uh, I was really against um, you know, actually having individuals that uh, couldn't vote, you know, only can vote in one primary anyway. I was against that even when we talked about that uh, several years ago. Uh, and so, you know, it's just something that I've been opposed to. I think that individuals should have the freedom to be able to vote for who they want to, who they choose to vote for. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that this is a, setting a dangerous precedent. If, 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 if this happens, uh, I will tell you, look for the Democratic Party to be back in charge in about 20 years. <laughs> Well, it's March is a long way off. That's when the next legislative session begins. Um, but there's already talk of, of what might be discussed next session. I'm hearing things about tax cuts, tax breaks, things like that, specifically on the grocery tax. The, um, there was a proposal kind of late in the session, last session, there's usually one every year about um, ending the state's sales tax on groceries. Um, given the fact that inflation is here, prices have risen, do you think that gives more momentum to a proposal like that for next session? Well, I think at the end of the day, what you'll see from budget chairmen in particular and individuals on the budget committees, they'll be concerned about the lack of revenue coming in as a result. What I don't want to see, um, right now I'd like to see some, um, you know, grocery tax holidays uh, to kind of start uh, testing it out. Hmm. Um, but one of the things that, that I have, uh, that I fear at the end of the day, uh, removal of the sales tax on groceries is something that I feel should happen. But we also got to look at uh, ways to to recoup some of those dollars. Um, I think you start with a payroll. I mean, a, a, a holiday right now while we're in in between session, and then I think then you go uh, figure out ways to generate enough revenue to to be able to eliminate it. But one of the things that I think we must also look at is we don't want to give individuals uh, an opportunity to increase the prices to make up for the revenue that the state is losing. That's right, on the local level. Up on, yes, absolutely. Right. The, the revenue that the state is losing, then you start seeing whether it's a municipality or you start seeing prices of the products go up, uh, to make up you know, gradually it, yeah. to make up for it, but the state of Alabama end up being the, becoming the losers. And so you just, yeah. you got to monitor those things. I think that there are certain items that should not have be taxed anyway. And so I think we start looking at uh, when we define grocery, we need to make certain that it's the SNAP definition of grocery. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's, we start there uh, and we start with uh, um, grocery tax holiday. And I do believe, adamantly believe that, um, you know, because it's a need, not a want, uh, and folks need nourishment to survive, I do think that's something that we have to look at. And I've been for it um, and, and we'll still support it. Mm -hmm. Something to watch as the, the session comes. It'll be here before you know it. Absolutely. So, Mr. Daniels, thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online at video.aptv.org. Capital Journal episodes are also available on APTV's free mobile app. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. And you can listen to past episodes of Capital Journal when you're driving or on the go with Capital Journal Podcasts. 
Next, I'm joined by Dr. Steve Murray, Director of the Alabama Department of Archives and History. Steve, thanks for coming on the show. Good to be with you, Todd. Um, I uh, read that your department this week um, is doing something special, uh, re giving back or re returning to tribes these artifacts, these funerary objects that um, were included in, in burials and things like this. Tell me about what's happening and, and why it's important. Sure. So we're beginning a new phase of a process that's required under a federal law called the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, or NAGPRA for short. It affects most museums in the country and government agencies. And what it says is that if there are Native American ancestral remains and funerary objects held by these institutions, uh, we have an obligation to work with Native American tribes today to identify who is most closely related to those materials that are historical, and then to work with them in actually returning those materials to a federally recognized tribe. Now we have extensive collections in this area that developed over a period of about four decades in the early 1900s. Uh, they were collected by men mostly in the central Alabama area who were archaeology enthusiasts and they were out and part of a movement that was happening nationally to try to document and collect as much as they could about Native American culture. They believed at the time that Native Americans had either disappeared or were disappearing from the scene and uh, they were trying to preserve what they could about uh, that history and culture. We know today the Native Americans didn't disappear. They're, they're alive, they're, they're, their uh, culture is vibrant, and they want uh, the public to know more about them. But they also have very legitimate concerns about the way that the burials of many of their ancestors were disturbed in the past and those materials brought into the collections of institutions. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, here in central Alabama, I mean, there are, are, are all kinds of, you know, uh, those, those kind of artifacts and everything. Um, tell me about this process, and, and I know that there is a, there's a display right now at Archives, and you're all, you're all beginning in the process of taking that down. We are. Uh, we, we actually started in 2018 in working to attain compliance with this law. It has required a tremendous amount of work by our staff to research the collections and be prepared to enter these conversations with the tribes in determining which tribes today are most appropriately affiliated with that material. So this week, our Board of Trustees took an administrative step to deaccession the first uh, sets of those materials from our collections. It means they were removed from our catalog of permanent collections, and it puts them in a queue to be returned to a tribe. Along with that, we've made a decision as an institution that the appropriate thing for us to do is to remove from display a very large number of funerary objects that are part of our exhibits. That includes the first Alabamians, it's our, that large standalone exhibit that covers Native Americans from prehistory to about 1700. Predominantly, that exhibition is populated with uh, materials that are documented funerary objects. And Native peoples have strong objections to the idea that institutions use materials that were taken from their ancestors' burials without permission and then put on display. And it's the kind of thing that when we pause and think about that today, it's hard not to agree with that position. We wouldn't want that done uh, to our ancestors' burials. And so in a spirit of partnership and as an indication of our respect for Native peoples, we're gonna take those materials off display and already we've begun work to design updates to those exhibits so that in a few years, we'll be able to build on and improve on what we have already, but we'll do it with materials that aren't sourced from Native American burials. So we'll still be able to go to, the, to, to your archives and, and experience that rich history. Absolutely, we are absolutely committed to maintaining Native American history and culture as a central component of the visitor experience. But what we're gonna have in the end or exhibits in which all Alabamians or the, ans or the descendants of former Alabamians can take pride. Mm. Uh, while I've got you, uh, I wanted to ask about this genealogy workshop. It sounds really interesting, and there's another one coming up on the 20th. That's right. We've got uh, fantastic reference staff that leads these workshops periodically. You can go on our website and learn about how to register for that. They take place on a Saturday, and it's formatted so that in, on Saturday morning, you spend time essentially in the classroom with our staff, learning about how to use different types of resources in our collections, or perhaps online, 
to get started or to solve particular challenges in your genealogy quest. So our next one coming up is specifically on African American history, which has some special challenges associated with it because of the history of slavery in, in, in our country. Uh, but that the morning is spent in classroom time, then you've got a, a lunch, and then in the afternoon you've got time to go into the research room and explore your own family's history. Uh, and then later in the fall we'll have a third in that series, and each one of those has a different point of focus. Sometimes they talk about land records, sometimes they focus on census records or other special topics like African American families. Oh, that's really interesting. And, and so. I how do people uh, sign up on the website, right? This brand new uh, We've got updated a, website. We're so proud of this new website that launched last week. It's archives.alabama.gov. You can learn about these workshops and register there, but also explore some really wonderful updated databases and other information that we're sharing there. There's great information for K-12 educators, uh, something for everybody. Well, I can't wait to check it out. Great. Steve, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, Todd. We'll be right back. The USS Alabama is a World War II era battleship that first served in the Atlantic Theater, but was better known for helping to take Japanese held islands in the Pacific between 1943 and 1945. During the Battle of the Philippine Sea, the Alabama's state of the art radar alerted the fleet to incoming aircraft, providing the Americans enough time to scramble fighters and decimate the attacking force. Later, the Alabama served during the Battle of Leyte Gulf and anchored in Tokyo Bay to unload Allied occupation forces. In 1964, the state of Alabama took possession of the battleship. Alabama school children raised $100,000 in nickels and dimes to help bring the ship to Mobile and create Battleship Memorial Park. The park features the Alabama, the World War II era submarine USS Drum, and an American military aircraft collection. Battleship Memorial Park is one of the state's most visited attractions. That's our show for tonight. Thanks for watching. We'll be back next week at 7.30 right here on Alabama Public Television. For our Capital Journal team, I'm Todd Stacy. We'll see you next time.